I'm all for keeping things simple in the kitchen. Believe me, I want an easy life. I weep when I read one of those recipes when it takes a whole lunch hour just to get through the list of ingredients, let alone do the shopping. Anyway, you don't need a lot of ingredients if the ones you use really hit you with flavour. I mean, look at these. This is why I go in for a little off-the-shelf exoticism, because I know if I have one of these pre-blended spice mixes at home, I can cook something really special after work any day without any effort whatsoever. dinner of zata chicken with fatouche salad, followed by grill blistered figs with mascarpone and pistachios, is the easiest way I know of producing that laid-back summer feeling regardless of the season. And it's very low effort. Ordinary chicken portions, which I like quite small, dribbled with olive oil, ordinary olive oil, not extra virgin. The transformational agent is this Middle Eastern spice blend. It's called Zata. It comprises thyme, sesame seeds, and ground sumac, which is itself a blood red berry with a really sharp astringent tang. And it helps counter that mellow woodsiness of the other spices. A thick coating. Make sure the pieces are really well covered with this bosky bark coloured mix because you want the flavours really to infuse deeply as well as creating a nubbly crispy burnished skin once they're roasted. So I'm going to leave the chicken to sit in its marinade rub for a while and then it'll need about 40 minutes in a really hot oven so that gives me plenty of time to get on with the salad later. cultures have ways of using up stale bread. The fatouche is a Middle Eastern salad which has wonderful shards of pita bread in it. This one comes via Syria. Snip the pita lengthways so you can open up each bread and then split them so that you have four very thin pita ovals. I like a bit of scissor work too, it makes me feel efficient. The chicken's really nearly out of the oven now, so it's wonderful and hot. I can just slide this on the tray beneath the chicken, it'll crisp up in no time, which is about how long it takes to assemble this salad. Juicy cubes of tomato, about three or four tomatoes, depending on the size. The whole cucumber cut up into rough triangles. Mm. I normally never bother to peel a cucumber, but there's something about that pure jade paleness here that I want. Although this is cool and refreshing, it has to have a bit of fire, even if it's only a mild bit. And for that, I want some spring onions. Three or four, depending on how fat they are. The snip. There's no need to make this fatouche just to go with the oven bronze chicken there. I do, just simply because I've got into the habit. It's a kind of no-brainer when I've got people for dinner after work. I know I've got supper together. But if you wanted, this for two should be lovely as supper in itself. But in which case I might throw in some chunks of salty feta. Ah, mint, which I am mad for. Great fat bunch of it, which along with the cucumber is so cool and refreshing. I want the mint chunky, rather more like a salad leaf than a bit of chopped herb. It suits me anyway, and this is a very rough and tumble salad, or it is the way I make it. Parsley as well. You need hardly chop the parsley. A few chops, and we're in. 
and a bit of garlic. I just find it easier to mince it straight on top of the salad, but you can easily make up a dressing separately. I think the pitta should be about brown by now. There they are. Mm, perfect. I have asbestos hands, but you may prefer to leave the pitta before snipping it in. I like to have most of the pitta in the salad now to absorb all those herbs and juices, but I like to leave one or two back just to snip over at the end for contrast and crunch. Let's toss everything together. Mm, I love the clatter of the pitta against the cucumber and tomatoes. The dressing I add straight into the bowl, and by dressing I mean the juice of a nice fat lemon. I want a lot of sourness here, and that's what helps make it so refreshing. And some olive oil. And, as ever, a good, crunchy smattering of salt. Spiced. All it needs now is a sprinkling of salt and only if you feel like it, some parsley and that couldn't be better. As for the salad, a final splintery topping of pita and the final late reward some sumac. Sumac is one of the components in the za'atar, which is on the chicken, and it is intensely, deeply and pleasurably sour. Yeah. My idea of heaven when I'm on holiday is to have breakfast from figs just picked from the tree. But figs here never have that honeyed sweetness. You have to give them a bit of help. There's some butter, a splash of orange flower water, going for the Arabian Nights feel here. A little more of that mood with the rose water. Some ground cinnamon, not so much that it overwhelms the figs, but just to enhance their mellow spiciness and some vanilla sugar. Mm, the smell of this is instant good mood for me. And heat this gently. Cut the figs crossways right down, though not quite to the bottom, so that they open like little flowers or little birds with their beaks open and squawking, waiting for worms from their mummy. So when the butter and spices have melted, it's going to slosh them into the gaping figs, blitz them in the oven, and then they will be ready to be dolloped with mascarpone and sprinkled with green, green pistachios. Perfect ending to an Indian summer supper.
have such a passion for Japanese food, but I am never going to start hand rolling my own sushi or chiseling radishes. But the thing is, Japanese home cooking is an entirely different affair. Noodles are always an undaunting delight. I just want to lift that bowl to my face and slurp. And I do. I love the Japanese way of eating cold noodles. I am aware that the notion of cold noodles is not exactly an invitation, but in reality there is something about that slippery tangle, mouth-filling, that is just wonderful. Those are soba noodles, which are largely buckwheat, which gives a lovely thick nuttiness to the pasta. I want some sesame seeds toasted while I'm about it. It just means scattering them in this pan and letting their flavour come to the fore as they get golden and slightly scorched. The noodles are cold, so they have a dressing rather than a sauce, and quite a scant one. First being rice vinegar, lovely sharpness. But everything needs balance in life, and against the sharpness of the vinegar, a bit of honey. The same amount of toasted sesame oil. And a good splash of soy. The noodles are quite sweet actually, so the saltiness of the soy works very well. These just need to be stirred together gently. A few spring onions I need here, a little bunch is all. Give a shake to my sesame seeds. And the seeds look just about done now, lightly scorched and toasted. Quick final check here. Perfect. Quick drain, and then they need to be drenched with ice cold water just to stop them cooking so they don't go mushy. Tip the noodles, look at these beautiful pale brown strands, into the dressing you've made. Scatter the spring onions over them and, of course, the lovely toasted sesame seeds. Let's toss everything together. It really is easier to use your hands. Also, it feels lovely. In an ideal world, you should leave the noodles to stand for about half an hour so that the flavours mellow and mingle, but it isn't absolutely necessary and, to be honest, not always entirely possible. When I make these for myself, I tend to eat just a huge bowlful of them, as they are. But if I've got some friends coming round, I love to make some seared tuna and gingery broccoli to go with. To make this old favourite of mine, tuna tataki, take a log of ludicrously ruby tuna, paint it with oil and mustard, and roll it in coarsely ground peppercorns to form a smokily hot crust. Sear the tuna in a really hot pan on all sides until only the barest edges are browned and the pepper crust is welded onto the fish. Cut into the finest slices you can and sprinkle with spring onions and twiggy strips of cucumber. To make my gingery broccoli, boil the tender leggy stems for the briefest of moments before plunging them into a bowl of ice water to stop them cooking any further and to keep their vivid green colour. I give this a faintly Japanese flavoured dressing of grated ginger, soy sauce, sesame seeds and a few drops of toasted sesame seed oil. Sometimes I want to go the holy way of the noodle, all steamed veg and seared fish. But other times, only chocolate will do. And in this mood, I have to have my chocolate pavlova. So 
about six egg whites, which need to be whisked till they're gleaming and satiny. Now this is the stage, and I want to start adding the sugar. Can you see these beautiful, white, smooth, satiny peaks? This is why a pavlova is called a pavlova. It was created in honour of Anna Pavlova, the ballerina, after a no doubt fabulous performance in Swan Lake. And this is her bending over with all her tulle. But first, the sugar, because meringue really is just sugar and egg whites. 300 grams of sugar for the six egg whites. Just add a spoonful at a time, serenely, slowly, unworriedly. Last bit in one. I am not much of a scientist. In fact, my school report said that I managed rather well considering I had absolutely no flair for the subject. But I do know that if you add vinegar to a meringue base when you're making a pav, it ensures that the inside stays gooey and marshmallowy while the outside crisps up. And this is what we want. And this is where Anna Pavlova's gleaming white swan gets turned into the mucky duck version of the pav. Cocoa, beautiful brown dust. Three spoonfuls. Sieve it because otherwise you will get horrible grainy lumps. Wonderful Aztec hillside I'm making here. I made the chocolate pav simply because I am so addicted both to making and eating pavlova. I just thought one day I wanted to do something a bit different. And um, as Mae West said, too much of a good thing can be wonderful. So I added some chocolate, and it's this bit that makes a difference. So get the best dark chocolate you can, half a bar, about 50 grams, and chop it into wonderful dark splinters. And the point about this is that these little chocolate bits will stay molten like nuggets of melting chocolate in the meringue. Add these to the cocoa dusted meringue and serenely and confidently fold in the cocoa vinegar and chocolate. Just keep turning the spoon round and down until everything is gently combined. And now I'm ready to mound the meringue onto the tin. I find that if you dollop teeny bits of meringue onto the tin, it keeps the paper from moving about when you're actually building up the pav base. And then mound pleasurably, slowly, as smooth as you go. The trick with the pavlova, along with the vinegar, is that when you put it in the oven, you put it in at a much hotter temperature than you normally would with a meringue, 180, which is gas mark four. And the minute it goes in, you turn it down to gas mark two, 150. And this means that the outside sears to a sudden crisp, but the inside cooks slowly and gently so you have that brown, melting, gooey marshmallow interior. Smooth this down. This will need about an hour and a quarter to cook, and then once it's cool, I can slather it with cream and cover it with raspberries. I always say, and when I say it, I believe it, which is that unlike most women, I don't have a particular thing about chocolate, <laughs> but I ask you, is this the cupboard of someone who doesn't have a thing about chocolate? I have an excuse for the dark and white chocolate buttons because I do use them all the time in cooking. Otherwise, I don't know what my excuse is. I do tend to buy things whenever I go on holiday. This is like a really big one, <laughs> a kilo, like a gold ingot of dark chocolate. Somehow feel better for having this in the house. So rather strange thing is that when I write chocolate recipes, I always find myself saying, you know, best quality chocolate. But you know, when you're just eating straight in the raw, you know, minimum 70% cocoa solids is not what you want. I want something like nutrageous, 
milk chocolate, peanuts, caramel, Reese's peanut butter. It's good for children too. I mean, this is my bribery and corruption drawer. But there's something rather more important. You know those days when you can't be bothered to cook a pudding? Well, frankly, can't be bothered to cook anything. My dinner of choice, frozen mini chocolates. Well, the meringue base has been out of the oven and should be cooled and is beautiful. Don't be alarmed when you see these cratery splinters. It's meant to be like that. Not least because you can now see all these lovely gooey bits of dark chewy chocolate underneath the crust. And anyway, this is not conveyor belt cookery. It's home food. It's meant to look like this. On top of a dusty cocoa layer, a fat gleaming wadge of double cream. I wouldn't worry about doing this too neatly, just sort of splosh it on. Then all it needs on top is a sort of tumbling layer of raspberries, all crimson matness. Fabulous. Oh, here they come. And finally, a bit of dark chocolate, just roughly shaved over. I have a weakness for all pads, but especially this darkly glowing beauty. This is very easy to make and very easy to eat. There is one difficult piece in between and that's actually cutting it, but greed finds a way.